Welcome to the third in a series of five in our fall lecture series at the University of Idaho and Montana State Integrated Design Lab lecture series. Um, I want to talk real quickly about a few events coming up and also say thank you to our funders, Better Bricks, Idaho Power, and Northwestern uh, Energy, and of course Montana State and University of Idaho. Um, we will be taking a brief break from this lecture series, actually three weeks off, three Wednesdays in a row where we won't be meeting, uh, next be for three separate reasons. Next week we've got the Better Bricks Awards and the kickoff of the Idaho Energy and Green Build Conference. So if you haven't signed up for those and you want to come, please do. There's forums around. Um, then we've got Halloween, I believe, and then we've got Green Build. And so we're starting up again with our last two on November 14th. Uh, with the low cost of high performance and having Gary Christensen and Ken Baker talking about two different projects uh, where costs were tracked pretty carefully and uh, various lead, actually, in this case, lead thresholds were achieved. And then finally, November 28th, talking about a uh, natural ventilation study uh, presented by our own uh, Dr. Genady. So with all of that behind us, welcome. And on behalf of the university, I want to say thanks to the design team from the Idaho Central Credit Union and the headquarters in Pocatello. I'll let you folks introduce yourself. Um, and folks in the room, feel free to make this a conversational event tonight. Thanks for coming. Great. Thanks, Kevin. I'm assuming I have to use the mic. Uh, let's do this guy here. OK. If you want. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate the introduction. Um, my name is Steve Christensen. I'm with LCA Architects here in Boise. And I brought with me our uh, mechanical and electrical engineer as part of our design team. Uh, Mike Wisdom with Engineering Incorporated and Jeff Johnson with uh, Item and Associates. And what we want to do today is go ahead and um, present the Idaho Central Credit Union headquarters building located in Chubbuck, Idaho. Um, it's been occupied now for roughly going on maybe about three months, I'd say. And before we get started on the building, I just want to give you a little uh, brief background on um, Idaho Central. Talk a little bit about our a little bit about our client and uh, what they were looking for from us. Um, they currently are in a in a little brick building located right behind their new building that they purchased back in, I think, 1998 from, from another financial institution. And it's roughly about 27,000 square feet. Now, Idaho Central Credit Union, they're the largest credit union in, in the state. And they're growing uh, quite rapidly. And so the little building that they were in, it's a typical little brick building. I'm not sure what year it was built, but little punched windows in it, not a lot of natural light, old technology. In fact, when you actually entered into the building, you'd enter through a little, uh, little vestibule that faced, a, faced directly east. And uh, as a visitor to the building, that was pretty much the, the last bit of natural light as you, as you walked through the building. Um, when you came in through the security area into their, into their main office area, it's uh, typical um, what you'd see back then where a lot of the CEOs, the VPs, they all had the the perimeter offices and the employees, for the most part, were in open office in a central area with not, with, uh, without a lot of natural light. So with, with this uh, particular client growing as rapidly as they, as they are, they felt the need to go ahead and start making a move. Now we started this project back in uh, 2004 is when um, we got started and uh, the credit union decided to make a road trip down to Salt Lake and see what some of the larger um, credit unions are doing down there. We went and visited, I think, probably four to five different credit unions. A couple of them were actually still under construction. One nearing completion, one probably about 50% into it, and then the other ones were, were, were completed. Um, that was a very worthwhile trip, um, especially the newer, the newer buildings because, of course, they were incorporating a lot of the newer technologies into their buildings that, that this client wasn't really familiar with. So we had a, a lot of good discussion with, with the architects and design teams as we walked through there and talked a lot about the pros and cons of them. 
And then, um, and then when we came back to Boise, we went ahead and actually started the de designing and programming efforts on, on their building with the lessons learned from, from that particular trip. So what we want to do now is basically run through our design approach and our strategies on, on developing and designing this particular building. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the daylighting strategies and then we're going to turn it over to Jeff Johnson, our electrical engineer, and he'll talk about the, the electrical side of things. Um, and then Mike Wisdom will talk about the mechanical side. So as we go ahead and, and start here, these are just some of the basic project goals, not, not to read a lot of PowerPoint stuff here, but just some, of the, just some of the overall goals. You can see a lot of them had to do with uh, healthy environments. Um, this particular, particular client is, again, um, very user-friendly with, with their employees. They understand that they're, the, they're their most important asset. But again, incorporate daylight strategies. That's a, that's a far cry from what their current building has. Uh, create pleasant, healthy environment, uh, thermal comfort, increased building technology, controllability of systems, and increased ventilation. So these are just a few of our points. Uh, we had quite a few project goals, but these are the ones we want to kind of focus on, on tonight. Oops, excuse me. Now on the daylight strategies, these were the ones that, uh, that we developed and also working with the Integrated Design Lab. They had a, they had a lot to do with uh, with the outcome of this building as well, working closely with Kevin. Um, so our, these are our main goals, if you will. On the occupied spaces that we wanted to go ahead and, and use daylighting as the primary light source on the majority of the occupied spaces. Site building orientation, as you, everybody knows, that's a very, very important aspect to, to daylighting, orienting, oriented, orienting the building correctly, as well as building massing, designing buildings that are, that are longer and uh, narrower than large boxes to, to get the daylighting into them. And then we also decided we wanted to, in fact, use the uh, physical model to um, see how um, what we're projecting in terms of daylighting when we're doing our renderings and stuff, it, how accurate actually is it. And then our goal was to provide an ambient level, lighting level of 30 to 40 foot candles. And then the big one as well, coming from where they're currently at, in their building to, to what we're doing here is relationship of daylight and of open offices to hard wall offices to let's recreate their uh, normal way of doing business and get the hard wall offices internal. And then uh, daylighting sources, we pretty much tried to achieve providing a minimum of two daylighting sources throughout the building the best we could. Would that be one big large plane with a corner window we did a lot of shared light. That'll show you going back and forth between corridors to light up the core. And then, um, and then the big part of it is also the, the integration of the daylight, electric light, mechanical system integration to complete the whole package, which was very rewarding at the, at the very end of this that we'll show you. Yep. First, we want to talk about building orientation and massing as our first slide here. This is our uh, site plan with the solar sun chart here. As you can see, it was a pretty big, uh, pretty big site. And um, the orientation of our building is such that, of course, it, it maximizes the, the daylighting to the south. And the, and the building footprint, as you can see, is, is long and narrow to capture as much daylighting into the interior space. The actual footprint of this building is uh, 95 by, by 196. And as you can, this is located over uh, in Pocatello, Idaho, basically Chubbuck, Idaho, which is right next door to Pocatello. Um, they get a tremendous amount of daylight over there for the most part of the year. They do have a, a fair amount of cloudy days in the wintertime, but, uh, but in, they do get a lot of very nice weather over there as well. Um, so this is our little uh, site plan with the, the polar sun, sun chart there. North is up. I didn't get the north error on there, but assume north's up there. And uh, so that's how we pretty much position the building. Um, so we move on to the next slide here. On the daylighting zones, the program was quite simple. It's a 68,000 square foot building consisting of four floors. And what these next slides are gonna represent here are the floor plates of each individual floor with the daylight zones indicated in, in yellow. 
On the first floor, it was pretty much um, not a lot of open office area. It was pretty much um, training for their, uh, for their employees. Of course, the main building lobby and the core functions that go with the, with the training, the large restrooms, the breakout areas. And however, we did go ahead and have a little bit of open office area again on the south side of the building. Um, as well, um, one other point I wanted to bring up here as well, on, the, on our building orientation, the way we did it, of course, with the, the minimum dimensions being in the east and west, on the east and west sides of the building, we tried to go ahead and put as many spaces that don't necessarily need daylighting onto those axis, onto those sides of the building. It was very, it worked out very well on, on this first floor as I show you, but as we go up into the building, just the program required that we had to have a lot of open office space. But we felt like we did pretty good on the first floor here on, on, the, on the east side. We have the electrical mechanical room, stair and mail room on that whole floor, so you don't have a lot of uh, issues with the direct sunlight penetrating those areas. On the, on the west side of the building, we have, the, we have a small training room, room up there, but we also have the main building lobby and another stair. And we'll talk about the main building lobby here in, here in a little bit. I think we maintained about uh, 14 feet, floor to floor, pretty much. There might have been a little bit more on the, on the lower floor. Um, the numbers that I have there in front of you, the 40 feet and the 20 feet, those represent actual dimensions from the exterior wall to, the, to our main core. One of our goals as well is to provide a minimum of a 10-foot uh, ceiling, ceiling in there. With a minimum of a 10-foot ceiling and windows being at 10 feet, Theoretically, we should be able to get about 25 feet of natural light penetration into our building. So as you can see on the south side, we did, we did pretty well. On, on the training rooms, the, the natural light penetration wasn't all that critical, being north, north light and the type of function that was being used for. As we move up onto the second floor, again, this is our uh, large daylighting zones. So a lot of large, a lot of large open office area. And then we have the uh, central core area. The central core area consisted primarily, again, of the, the basic functions that we didn't feel required, required a lot of natural light, if any, being the, being the restrooms, the little breakout workrooms, and uh, the conference rooms there. However, in the conference rooms, we, we'll go ahead and show you some pictures la later on about how we were able to actually share the light from, from, these, from these large open office areas. Off to the left is uh, above the lobby there, there's, uh, there's actually a two-story uh, lobby space there that gets quite a bit of direct natural light we'll talk about. But as you can see again on the numbers there, 24 feet we were able to get very good natural light penetration, 30 feet from the north and 40 on the big lending side of things. And we keep on working up our, uh, working our way up the building. The, the second floor plate's pretty much, or the third floor plate's pretty much identical to the second floor plate. Again, all the core areas internal, open office on the perimeter. Fourth floor pr uh, presented kind of a unique challenge to us because this is where all the, the VPs and the CEOs uh, uh, live in the building. And of course, they wanted to keep with their train of thought that they wanted to have hard wall offices and enclosed offices and no open office with the exception of the administrative type area, which is where the number 40 is up there on the top of the screen. So we were dealt with the issue, okay, we're gonna do all these hard wall offices, and yet we don't want a dark little corridor wrapping around the spine. As you move up through this building, we have all this nat nice natural daylighting, and then to get up on the main executive floor for, for people visiting the building, be, be walking into all of a sudden a dark, dark hallway. So we'll go ahead and show you some pictures on how we dealt with that, but it's pretty much through shared lighting, we we're able to talk them into having large windows, uh, floor to ceiling in all their offices with, with decorative glazing down at the lower level for privacy and then clear glazing up on top. This is the building section of uh, just showing you again the daylighting areas, daylighting zones, and, and then the main core area just in section. Next, we looked at the wall system on how our south, south wall was gonna work based on our uh, solar sun charts here. 
on the, um, starting over at the, the one on the left is, is the summer solstice. With the summer being where we're at, the, the sun is quite high and you can see there is, there, is, there is hardly any light penetration, direct sun coming into the building off the south. On the, on the equinox at noon, we are getting a little, but the, but the outdoor shading device is actually blocking most of it, and we're getting some on the little interior light shelves that we designed to bounce light up and back into the space. And then, as you know, on, on the winter months, the sun's down low, and, and that's really a hard one to, to control. So um, we do get a lot of uh, direct penetration of natural light, and so we had to go with uh, blinds, of course, during those particular months to control to control the direct penetration. Again, we wanted to maintain at a minimum 10 foot ceiling heights. This was also for our uh, indirect lighting to make sure we had a plenty of distance there between the light fixture and our ceiling to get a good bounce. And then also to provide uh, a good space for these large open floor plates and not to have a, lar a small ceiling or a low ceiling in there. A little shading device de detail. Um, what we basically did, this was built out of a structural tube steel that was uh, bolted onto some knife plates on the building. Um, we used a six by two tube steel, basically at six inches on center, marching across there. Um, we're, we were a little bit concerned that this might be a little bit of a maintenance problem later on down the road if we were just painting these devices. So um, we elected to go ahead and have them, all these devices powder coated for the longevity and, and maintenance of this building. The little interior light shelf detail will show you some pictures of all these different devices, but this is on the inside of the building. We were able to, our, our spans between columns that were supporting this interior light shelf were, um, I think the largest one was probably just over 20 feet. But we were able to use aluminum uh, tube, two by four aluminum tube from Conier as our structural frame, and that basically spanned from column to column, 20 feet we were able to to have this thing span without having anything else coming down from the ceiling to help support it. The actual deflector itself, we used uh, powder coated white perforated metal to get a good bounce off that. The, uh, then we started looking at, at the type of glazing we wanted to, to work on here as well. And um, one, of the main, one of the main objectives on this building was to uh, submit this to Idaho Power for the power in, for the, the power incentives, and so we took a kind of a quick look at that. We we pretty much knew what what, what color glass we wanted for the aesthetics of the building, and then we uh, of course worked with our mechanical engineer and worked numbers. But on the Idaho Power uh, premium glass incentive, they actually require a U factor of 0.42. Uh, shading coefficient of 0.4 and a visual light transmission of 0.50. The type of glass that we used in this building was a PPG solar band 60 and I won't bother reading all the numbers to you across the board there but uh, but uh, but we exceeded the the Idaho power so so we felt pretty good that we we're on our on the right road for some incentive dollars back there on that one. Just to give you the the number we we're a actually able to achieve $12,000 credit back on this particular building for the owner, just on glazing alone. Um, then we just started looking at playing around with some uh, schematic building elevations, kind of getting an idea how it's going to look. Again, uh, east-west elevations narrower than uh, uh, north and south elevations. Start drawing the little sun shading devices on there, see how it all play out. The, the owner, um, our client, as far as architectural style, um, we did a couple different variations, but we also toured a lot of buildings with these people. And this is one, this is one building of a whole multi-phase that they have planned down the road for their campus. So they wanted to have an architecture that, uh, that was, um, I won't really say monumental, but they wanted to have something that said, uh, stable as their financial institution, more or less talk about them. They've been around forever, they're going to be around for a long, long time and not have a lot of cutting edge type architecture. So we, we basically developed a building to, to meet their aesthetics needs as well. Uh, developing the model, this is where we uh, started putting to test our uh, shading devices and uh, window heights on this particular building, working with uh, 
Kevin here at the Integrated Design Lab. We went ahead and built the model, as you can see on the, on the pictures there, right here in the direct sun simulator. And there was, there was quite a bit of study done here and, and um, got a lot of data. There was, uh, I'll just show you just, just one room in particular here. This is a room over on, on the south side of the building. And this was the baseline without any uh, shading devices or light reflectors on it. As you can see in June when the sun's up high, um, we get minimal, minimal uh, direct sun penetration, but it's still for about 10 hours a day there. As we move across September uh, 21st again with no shading devices, this room actually received 12 hours of direct sun. And, oops, excuse me. And then uh, in December, the, where the sun's low, uh, we're getting, getting eight hours of direct sun into here. So we went ahead and, and put on our, on our devices here. Get this thing to work. There we go. As we put on our devices here, um, now on June we're, we're down to two hours where before we were, we were getting quite a bit of sun. And then on September now we're down to four hours and I think before it was up to 12 hours. And then in, on December where we have uh, low sun angles again, we've, we've uh, decreased it by one half of what the baseline was. On the implementation, what I want to talk about here a little bit is just show you some um, actual uh, construction photos of this building being built in and how the light starts penetrating this building. This building also had, a, that Mike's going to talk a little bit about here in a minute, but it also had an access floor in it that was uh, one foot eight up above this uh, concrete floor that you see here. So these windows are actually a lot lower to the finished floor than this picture represents. The windows themselves, I believe, are uh, two foot eight above finished floor. That allows uh, up on some of those upper offices where they're moving furniture actually up against the, the windows to, to have them up against walls instead up against the glass. So as you can see, lar large window openings here. These are all taken from the, from the south. Uh, second floor in progress here. But you can just see the amount of natural light that's coming in here into this building. And then here's where we're starting to get some finishes installed on this building just to make it a little bit brighter and we have the access floor installed here. Um, but you can see in this particular picture, this is one of the areas where the glazing on the south actually went all the way down to the floor versus stopping at a bulkhead. And then on the, you can see the core areas where we have some, uh, the borrowed lights up above. Kevin. We have a question from Jim Chitowski online, so uh, maybe just really quickly repeat it. Um, the, uh, he wants to know about what did you what did you do, like what tools did you use to analyze the solar shading, like that. So the shading devices and whatever. Oh, the question was what what tools did we use to to analyze the solar shading devices? Actually, we uh, used all the tools that the Integrated Design Lab had here as a little. <laughs> The Healy Dawn, correct, and the overcast uh, um, instruments. So actually, we, we used Kevin as, as the primary resource to, uh, to get us through how, how long our shading devices had to be and, and the location of them. And I think we we're pretty much uh, just going through some of our initial assumptions on aesthetics. We were pretty close to, to, to being okay. Again, natural light coming in from, from the south. And you can see the direct sun penetration coming in on the floor without any, without any shading devices. Uh, again, the borrowed light. Now, some of this is up on, the, up on that fourth floor that I was talking about where we were concerned with a uh, real dark corridor. So this is that row of uh, executive offices where we have light uh, going, frames going all the way from, from floor to ceiling to, to light the space up. Now we, uh, the building's starting to take shape here with uh, ceiling finishes in here. We uh, specifically, of course, went with a uh, pretty light colored carpet, nothing dark. Um, light colored and light colored paint and light colored walls for the reflectivity of the sun as well as, as the light fixtures Jeff's going to talk about. As far as um, 
light sources coming in from, from different directions. The slide down on the, on the lower left, uh, we're able to again try and meet one of our goals is having natural light come into two different locations within a single space. So we got the light coming in down from the corridor, which actually when you're walking down there during the different parts of the day creates quite a nice view of some mountains out there. And then the natural light coming in from the side there from the offices. This just shows the, the glazing nearing completion. We pretty much focused to date on just the glazing on the south side, but the, the glazing on the north side was pretty much a split image of everything that was happening on the, on the south side with the exception of the, uh, the shading devices and right, re light reflectors. So the glazing, the large curtain wall that you see there, that's actually glazing for the training rooms that was located on the north side there. These are the shading devices that, are, that have now been installed. Uh, you can see them there actually providing shade to the windows on the one, one slide there to the right. And then uh, it just so happens that, uh, just talked a little bit here about shadows, that uh, shadows are one of the, the real fun parts of, of designing. It's basically another tool for the, for the architect, as you know, to, to make this building read three-dimensionally. And um, so when we design buildings, shade and shadow become a big design element as we're, we're making uh, penetrations and, and different elements on, onto this particular building. But the funny thing on this one here, we had no idea, but you can see the little Idaho Central Credit Union coin up there on the little break room over or canopy there. If you look at the diagonals there, it actually replicates the shadows of the shading device. So we thought that was kind of interesting just by chance that that happened just by chance, so that was very interesting. Uh, this is uh, the interior light shelf here. I apologize, I didn't have a picture of the interior light shelf with the, with the blind all the way pulled up. Um, but again, this is the aluminum uh, tubing that went from column to column with the, with the perforated metal on it to get the, the light to bounce up on the ceiling there. And then again, a little bit more discussion on the borrowed light. Again, just to achieve that one goal that we wanted to have uh, multiple sources of daylight into spaces. Um, we talked about the slide up on the upper left is already, but the one kind of in the middle on the upper part of it, that's the ex executive lobby when you're to come off the elevator up on the fourth floor. Uh, what's not installed there now uh, is that lobby actually has um, full glazing all glass doors, no frames or anything for that, for that vestibule. And then acro right across from there, you can see that the, the natural light coming in from one of the uh, vice president's offices to, to light this very interior space as part of the core. We're still achieving to get some natural light in here. Now, the other one I wanted to show you here is the, the borrowed light from the, the main building lobby off to the right there the two-story space. Now this, this gets a lot of direct sun later in the day, but again, it's on the west side of the building. And so the thought process there is that typically the, the employees come to work in the morning hours, and when, when the sun comes all the way around here, typically there's not gonna be a lot of business, if any, coming in, into this lobby for the, for the direct light. Probably more so later in the summer, um, but it's re we really didn't feel like it was a critical task area and we were able to, to work our way through that one. The, our client really wasn't sure what they were gonna do in the lobby at the time this building was built, if they were gonna man it or not, and security issues. So we went ahead and built a, a desk for them, reception counter, just in case. And we just decided that, let the building be built, let the user use the building over time, discuss it back with the client, and if we need to, we'd go ahead and put some mecha shades on that particular lobby to control the direct light. But back to the borrowed light, uh, the slide there in the middle on the bottom is actually the balcony that looks down into the lobby. And then there's glazing uh, on the wall there. That's the glazing that's for open office area just on the opposite side of the wall. And the slide in the lower left-hand corner is in fact the natural light coming into that particular space. So again, a lot of natural borrowed light trying to get into this building. Here's the lobby again. Uh, this was at their grand opening. This, this slide here was taken probably about uh, 6, 6.30 in the evening. And um, so a lot, a lot of light. 
but we haven't heard any any complaints from them. They've been in there about three months now. So, uh, break room again, a very pleasant place to to work for their employees. Lots of light. And then the executive offices up on the fourth floor. Large offices, lots of big windows. This view here is taking, taking I think, uh, south, southeast, southeast. This is actually the building core area. Even though on the floor plate you could see that it was in some of the areas is back from the exterior wall up to 40 feet, some, some places 20 to 30 feet. But this is where we had little breakout areas, copy rooms and, and restrooms, but we we're still able to, to provide plenty of natural light in there. And then once you're in this particular area, you actually to look back and forth across the floor plate and actually have views outside the windows. Now the other thing we want to talk about a little bit is just the, on the stairs. We made the stairs a pretty good design element. They wanted a, a healthy building for their employees. And so we took advantage of designing the stairs to, uh, for the employees, hoping that they would actually use them instead of going into a dark stair with just artificial lighting in them. We brought the stairs to the outside and brought curtain wall all the way from, from floor to ceiling. Up these. So as you go up these stairs, you not only get the natural light, but the views as you, as you walk, through these build, uh, walk through the stairs. I think um, they're actually using them. They've actually, I think from top to bottom is like 95 steps. So they're kind of having fun with it. As, as the employees walk up each set of floors, they have uh, actual sea, sea level elevation signs posted on each landing and the number of risers they've climbed to date. So they're having a good time with that particular element to the project. Furnishings wa was a big part of the design process. In their, in their old building, they had some of the older sale furnishings with the, with the higher partitions. Um, we spent a lot of time with them just talking about furnishings and before you order them to make sure we get the low partitions or it's going to basically blow everything out of the water that we've worked to achieve. And uh, so they followed through and, and it helped make the project even more successful. So some of these partitions, the lower ones are just like about, I think they're 30, just over 36, 38 inches, then we get up to 43 and 55 inches or something on the higher, on the higher ones. Steve, you have to point out how the ones perpendicular to the window wall are, are a little higher, and the ones parallel to the window wall are a little lower. It's so great. Right, right. Yeah, the, the other item that, that we worked with them very, very hard on is, is the layout of the furniture is to lay the furniture out such that the low partitions, like Kevin said, are in fact perpendicular to the window wall and not parallel to get the more, to, to keep the light coming in in lieu of blocking it. So you can see on, on these slides again how they, they actually uh, worked with us and uh, listened to us. Ken? Steve, you know what, the, uh, do you remember what the electric lighting power density was in the office spaces here? Um, I don't, do you, Jeff, do you know? Yeah, in the open office area, You, you, you question what was the electric light densities? Power densities. Power densities, Power densities in the open office areas uh, came out to approximately 0.7 watts. It was about just under half of what the, the lot, so that's pretty good. That's really good. Again, just some additional uh, furnishing pictures. You can see the views out, out the windows again. Um, now I want to turn it over to Jeff, our electrical engineer, and he's going to talk about the goals that he went through on uh, the de designing and developing of the electrical aspects. Which button's which? That one's uh, forward. Yeah. Like Steve said, I'm Jeff Johnson with Item and Associates, and uh, we were we had the pleasure of being on this team working on the electrical engineering and uh, designing primarily the lighting, power distribution, fire alarm, stuff like that. All the stuff that, that everybody likes to forget about until it breaks. Um, just to touch on a few goals 
real quickly on, on the lighting system, and I'm primarily going to focus on the lighting system because that's, that's the portion of, of the design that, that has the biggest impact on, on uh, the integrated design process that we went through in, in terms of energy efficiency and, uh, and comfort levels in the space. Um, our goals here are, are briefly described, energy efficient, cost effective lighting design. Um, we were charged with, uh, with a goal to maximize the energy efficiency by a reduction in interior lighting load of at least 10% below minimum code required densities. Um, but along with that, we were charged to utilize accepted proven lighting technologies for cost efficiencies and ease of maintenance, not introduce technologies that may, may be a little bit ahead of, of the market in terms of, of cost efficiencies and, uh, and cost of replacement and, and, uh, and maintenance costs. Um, and also to implement an automatic lighting control system for energy conservation. Uh, a caveat on that, that's now required by code um, however, it, it, does, it does promote um, energy conservation and it also promotes um, ease of use for the, for the owner and um, in terms of how they want to set up the, the lighting system. Um, the other bullet here, create a pleasant working environment. Steve touched on that briefly uh, through, through his presentation. Um, a couple of the things that we wanted to accomplish on our lighting design was to minimize glare in the office environments. Uh, through the use of, of indirect lighting. As you could see from the floor plates, uh, the majority of this building is an open office environment. Uh, most of the tasks that are being performed in here do involve computers. And uh, so we wanted to take a very careful look at, at minimizing the effects of glare on, on the workers and uh, the employees of the organization and create a very comfortable atmosphere for them to, uh, to do their tasks. Um, the other thing, just as a side note, that I'm not going to touch on very much in this, in this presentation, but um, we, we were charged with accentuating areas of interest through the use of lighting. If you've been through the facility, one of the things that they have done a wonderful job, a superb job with in this building is they've, they've incorporated artwork that is, that is local to, to the state of Idaho. They have artwork throughout the facility that that complements all of the things that we know and love as being Idahoans. And, uh, and so one of our charges was to, was to use the artificial light that, that we have in the space to accentuate those areas, to create areas of interest within the building, um, and to make it very pleasing for, for the occupants. Uh, the third goal here, utilize natural daylight as primary light source where available. Um, incorporate daylight harvesting techniques to reduce energy usage, and I'll get into that uh, here briefly. Um, alongside of that is, is to minimize the personal interaction with daylight and controls. In other words, what I'm, what I'm saying by that is, is, uh, is utilizing technology that, 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 the, that the, the users don't necessarily physically know that, that there's a change taking place. There's not a switch from the lights being all on to all off. Um, it's, a, it's gradual as the, sun, as the sun moves from one side of the building to the other. Um, the lighting levels in that area will change um, linearly with, with the effects of the sunlight. Um, lighting technology implemented, um, I'll touch on these real briefly, indirect luminaires, uh, primarily throughout uh, most areas of the building. Uh, linear T8 lamps was the lamp technology that we, that we settled on uh, to use um, back to the cost-effective technologies uh, that are in place. Uh, electronic dimming ballasts, we used uh, electronic dimming ballasts in the daylight harvesting zones. Um, rather than having step, step dimming or manual dimming, we utilized an electronic daylight or dimming ballast to, to achieve that linear uh, relationship with the change in, in natural daylight. Um, incorporated with the dimming ballast, we use zero to 10 volt daylighting sensors to measure the level of light that's coming into a space and, and appropriately adjust the level of the ballast that's in the light fixture to accommodate for that. And, uh, and integration into the lighting control system as a whole. Uh, the indirect luminaires that we, that we settled on, um, we've settled on a, a primarily indirect lighting fixture. Um, the, the distribution, as you can see up there, is 95% is uplight. We, we put a, a partially perforated housing on the fixture to have a little bit of, 
of, uh, of light coming through the housing so that uh, you didn't have a dark underbelly on the light fixture. Um, sometimes that, that can create a, a, a personal, uh, you don't know where the light's coming from because you have this very dark surface and then you have a very bright ceiling above it. And, and so we want to try to uh, get a little bit of that light coming out of the fixture more for aesthetics and, and uh, those types of applications. Uh, the fixture efficacy um, based upon the, the manufacturer's published literature is 81.6%. That basically means that uh, the light that's coming out of that fixture, we're using 81% of the light that's produced in that fixture for usable purposes. Um, we settled on a three lamp cross section and I do need to give credit to the manufacturer who I stole their picture uh, that comes from Peerless. Um, one of the things about this fixture that, that, we, that we really liked is in terms of indirect lighting, it was a very cost effective solution. We didn't put a lot of bells and whistles on our, on our fixtures throughout this space. We tried to make it as cost effective yet meet the intent of, of the design um, as we could. Um, save a little bit of, uh, of money for some of those accentuating areas where we wanted to really highlight some of the artwork and, uh, and, and other areas of the, of the building. Uh, the T8 lamps that we used, we used a 3500 degree Kelvin uh, lamp temperature lamp. We felt that that was, was appropriate given the amount of natural daylight that is coming into the space as well as uh, we have a lot of personal interaction, human to human interaction and we find that that, that lamp temperature um, renders skin, t skin tones very well. Um, the lamps uh, have a 25,000 hour rated life on a 12 hour start. I wanna be careful to point that out. Um, the, lamp, the lamp life will, will depreciate the more times you start it and stop it. Um, so that's published data on a, on a 12 hour start, which in this, when this, in this application is probably more realistic than not because this is gonna be an open, open office environment where they're gonna come in at, uh, at seven in the morning and turn the lights on and then they're gonna leave at, at eight o'clock at night and turn the lights off. So we will have uh, most likely 12 hours between, between start and stop of, of, the, of the lamps. Um, initial lumens output 2950, design lumens 2800. Um, that basically calculates with a ballast factor of uh, lumens per watt of, of, of about 92 lumens per watt, which is, which is very good. We're, we're very satisfied with that. Um, here's a cute little picture of the Lutron ballast that we, that we utilized uh, in our daylight harvesting schemes. Um, it's 100% to 10% dimming capable. In other words, it can drive the lamp at 100% output down to 10%. Um, there are products on the market today that, that can drive lamps down to as low as 1%. In this, in this application, we didn't feel that the cost to jump to that level of technology um, was warranted because, because we're, we're, we're talking about general office tasks and we're talking about uh, fairly low levels of light anyway. Um, zero to 10 volt control input. Um, to touch on that, uh, the picture up at the, up at the top right there, that's uh, the center picture there is a picture of the lighting sensor that we use, that's a Hubble sensor. Um, it adjusts the dimming ballast level based upon the measured daylight. Um, how that works basically, um, not to bore you with a lot of electrical stuff, but uh, the output voltage of that sensor operates inversely um, proportional to the amount of, of light that it senses. So uh, the more light that's in the space, the less voltage it's going to output. And the less voltage that it outputs to the ballast, the less light you get out of that light fixture and vice versa. Um, it has an ability to sense from zero to 500 foot candles. Um, I put that on there because we did, we went back uh, about, a, about three weeks ago and, and kind of did a calibration with the owner on how the system would, would work and we, we did some foot candle measurements and uh, we measured at eight in the morning, we put the sensor right in front of the window in a, in a vertical plane and we were already getting about 200, 250 foot candles of light and that was on a cloudy day. So this sensor is, is, is uh, well within the range of, of the anticipated light levels that it's going to see from, uh, from the natural daylight coming into the space. Um, it has a selectable dimming rate. Uh, what that means is that you can adjust the, the, 
the speed at which it, it changes the, the level of light. And why that's important and why we wanted a, a, a sensor that has a selectable dimming rate is because as clouds come, clouds come through, uh, that, that can, if a cloud comes right over the sun, it can really drop your natural daylighting levels very drastically and, and fast. And so uh, we, we wanted a, a sensor that would, that would delay that function. If the cloud's just going to be a temporary hindrance to the natural daylight in the space, we don't want the lights going down and up and down and up and down and up as, as the cloud cover moves, so moves across uh, outside. Um, the maximum output is adjustable on this sensor, and that's one of the things that I'll touch on, on uh, a little bit later. But what that means is, is we have the ability with the sensor to set the maximum output on the light on the light fixture that, uh, and what, what we did was we did some measurements in the space afterwards and we found that our foot candle levels were drastically higher than what we had designed to. And what, what the, uh, the adjustable output allows for is we can, we can set that maximum down lower and we get the energy savings from that and uh, we're not compromising the lighting in the space. Um, a comment on, on the sensors. Um, placement of the sensor is, is critical. Here's a typical example of, of how we tried to, to place our daylight sensors. Um, we oriented our light fixtures perpendicular to the wall, to the, to the lighting surface. And what that does is it allows us to put our sensor directly in the, in the middle of those two light fixtures so that we're not getting uh, false readings from the light that's coming from the light fixtures. You can picture the light fixture here and the light is coming up out of it. Um, we don't want to get false readings on that, off that sensor from the, from the artificial light that we have in the space. We also set it back approximately 10 feet from the window so that we're getting accurate readings on the interior of the space um, so, that, uh, so that we're not adversely affecting the lighting that's farther into the space and dimming the light farther than we need to. Um, not on this application, no. No, it is. Is there a manual override on this system? It was, it was designed to, to operate dimming 100% of the time. Um, some of the uh, analysis and the results here. Um, on the design side, we, uh, we did our photometric analysis with, uh, with a, a basic design average of about 30 foot candles. Um, our max to min ratios varied from anywhere from four to one to eight to one. Um, average to min ratios were about three to five to one. Uh, we were very happy with, with, those, uh, with those ratios. In other words, we're, we're not seeing a, a drastic difference between light and dark over the work, work surface. And what is, what is, uh, that's one of the benefits of having an indirect lighting surface or system where we're, where we're distributing the light off of the ceiling as, uh, as our reflective plane. Measured light levels, this is where it got a little bit interesting for us. Uh, we, we went back and measured uh, two months after occupancy and we were finding in most of the open office areas that we were seeing a 60 foot candle average, um, which, is, which is drastically higher than what we had anticipated. Is that, uh, is that a combination electric light and daylight? No, we did this at night. At night. We, okay. we did all of our artificial lighting calculations at night um, to, to get a, a baseline of, of where we were at. Um, some of the things that, that we learned from, from the difference between the measured and the, and the uh, design levels, as Steve touched on earlier, Steve did a wonderful job of utilizing very reflective surfaces, very light walls, very reflective ceilings, um, very light floors. The, the floor is actually a very reflective uh, surface based upon the, the color of the carpet that was used. Um, those, those types of things um, we accounted for more conservatively in our calculations and uh, we reaped the benefits of, of having uh, an abundance of light in this, in this design. Um, the other thing that, uh, that we accounted for when we, when we did our calculations was we depreciated, uh, we depreciated our calculations based upon 
the existence of open office furniture in the, in the space because that has a drastic effect on our light levels as well. One of the things that we found again was the, the, the furniture that they selected was not only very low, which was very good for us, but it was very reflective as well. And so it did not eat up a lot of our light. We were able to utilize um, maximum amount of light out of our light fixtures. In hindsight, we would probably, um, knowing that we have those reflective surfaces, we would probably reduce our, our, uh, our design even further. So that reflects the uh, 0.7 watts per square foot, the open office, office area? It does. 60 foot panels, was that that's the top level? It was. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Calibration with the owner. Um, this was an important step that, that we took on our own accord. Um, one of the things that I don't know that we've touched on yet, but the building was not commissioned. Uh, we didn't have an independent commissioning agent on, on board to, to commi commission these systems. But uh, because we feel it's very important to, to have the lessons learned from, from our perspective, um, we chose to, to take a trip over and, and calibrate this system with the owner. And that's where we did our light level readings. That's where we, we calibrated the sensors. Um, and we worked through each of the spaces to make sure that they were operating as, as we had intended them to. One of the benefits that we, that we reaped on that, as I touched on earlier, is we reduced the average light levels about 25% in the daylight zones. We dropped that 60-foot candle average down to 45 just by adjusting the maximum output on the sensor. And, um, and that 25% reduction in light level is a linear relationship to the, to the energy usage. So where we're using 60-foot candles at 100% output, we're now operating the lamps, the light fixtures, at 75% and we're getting the energy savings off of that. So a uh, quick calculation that I did based upon the square footage that we, that we daylight harvested in, um, we dropped our, our lumens or our, uh, our watt densities from about 0.7 to about 0.55, which uh, we're very happy with. Um, we verified the operation during daylight hours. We went back the next morning after uh, after we set all the sensors and uh, we opened all the blinds and we watched what happened when the sun came up. And uh, one of the very interesting things that we found about uh, found out when we did this is, is, as you could see, this is a four-story building and up on the upper floors, um, the sun comes over the horizon early in the morning and it's actually uh, directed straight into the light sensors. And so we were, we were very nervous when we, when we saw that happen uh, very early on in the morning, but once, once the sun got up over the, over the canopy of the building, um, the system operated properly. Um, one of the things we found out about that, we would probably implement shrouds of some sort on our, on our sensors in those applications from, from here on out to minimize that effect of uh, abnormal conditions. Um, given the height of the building and where we are in relation to the horizon. Um, some pictures of our daylighting system in operation. Um, this is in the north facing daylight zone up on the second floor. Um, as you can see the interior space, um, the artificial light is on. We did not uh, utilize daylighting har daylight harvesting techniques on the interior side of the space. And that was uh, a decision made as a result of the daylight uh, model that was produced by Kevin and, and, uh, and LCA. Um, we found that, that our usable daylight was, was penetrating approximately 20 to 25 feet into the building. On the north side, we have about a 40 foot, uh, 40 foot space there. And so um, we utilized uh, longer light fixtures, 12 foot long, 12 foot long light fixtures and uh, we utilize the daylight harvesting on the exterior portion of that. And as you can see, uh, the light fixtures are on, but they are dimmed to full, and uh, our average readings at the work surface here are, uh, are somewhere in the range of 30 to 45 foot candles. This is uh, a picture of the same area with the occupied, uh, with the furniture in it. And again, um, overall, we're seeing a very uniform work surface uh, illumination level. One of the things that we had to work with with the, with the client on a daylight harvesting system of this nature is, is the perception. Um, 
as you can see in looking at the ceiling, because that's what we're talking about right now, um, you have bright, you have bright uh, surfaces at the interior portion and you have very dim surfaces here. But uh, we've, we've gone through and, and um, really encouraged them to look at the work surfaces and verified that with our calculations that, uh, that the work surface plane is, is a very uniform level of, of illumination. Did you find that people uh, had a preference for whether they proceeded in this daylight versus the visual light? You know, we didn't ask that question. Um, one of the things is we, the client kind of assigned people to specific locations, but we have not gone back and asked that question. It is a good question to ask because of the amount of natural daylight coming in, and, and, it's, and it's also specific to which side of the building that they're on, too. I have a shot here um, on the south-facing daylight zone, and this was uh, the narrower uh, foot plate here, or floor plate, and uh, we, we elected to use the same length of light fixture, but go ahead and daylight harvest throughout the entire space. And as you can see, the, the daylight system is, is operational. Here's a good picture of, uh, of the light shelves in action. One thing that, uh, that I want to touch on on this, on this particular slide that, uh, that is an important lesson learned is uh, we probably wouldn't do again, um, and that is to, to utilize our, our daylighting fixtures with our emergency lighting. As you can see, as you go down, as you go down through, there are select fixtures that are on, and those are on 100% of the time because they are for emergency purposes, as required by, uh, by life safety codes. Um, what we would probably do in the future is, is look, at, uh, look at utilizing integral emergency lighting units separate from the light fixtures. I think it, it has a, per, has a tendency to, to create a perception that something's wrong with this, with this, uh, with this lighting system, and, that, and that's, a, that's an important lesson that we learned and uh, we'll probably do different in the future. Uh, in summary, building interior lighting system operates at 12% below the International Energy Conservation Code requirements. That's before the implementation of uh, dimming daylight harvesting controls. In addition, that's below or that's, uh, that's not taking into account the adjustments that we made on, on the daylighting areas. Uh, the daylighting technology that we used, uh, we used that in approximately 27% of the building floor area, which we're very happy with. Um, and in terms of lighting uh, incentives that we received back from Idaho Power, um, that, that qualified for about $9,200 worth of, uh, of the incentive. And there's a pretty picture of the incentive check uh, overall for the, for the project, which we're very happy for. No, they are not. They are not. Forward. <clears throat> Thank you. Boy, after all that uh, gigawatts, mega lumens, and square foots, we're going to pick up the pace and get into the fast world of HVAC. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm Mike Wisdom with the Engineering Incorporated, located here in Boise, and uh, we had the pleasure of being the mechanical engineers on this project. We did the heating and air conditioning, fire protection, and plumbing design for this facility. Our uh, goals were similar to the ones that uh, shook down out of the architectural. They wanted an energy efficient design. They uh, are used to old style buildings uh, with plunkers on the roof that uh, they just get what they get. Uh, they were very concerned about thermal comfort. They wanted a system that was controllable. They wanted to be able to look and see what was going on. Uh, it had to be flexible with the raised floor system that they were gonna come in with the partitions and things. They wanted to be able to move around and not have to go through a major redesign on their heating and air conditioning system. They wanted good ventilation. As Steve alluded, uh, they know that one of their major assets are their people. They wanted a, a, a system that was well ventilated. They did not want a whole bunch of excuses. I can't work today because I'm feeling sick. Uh, it's stuffy and all those sort of things. And the result of that was the underfloor system that uh, we provided for them. 
this is a little difficult to see, but, but not too bad. The, the major part of it here is the green for us. The, uh, the model that, that was done, uh, the Integrated Design Lab, helped with that uh, through uh, a, a firm in uh, Portland, I believe. Solark. Solark, yes. And uh, they input the building and they ran some, uh, some options for us that, that helped to create a small load. The, one of the major ones was they, they recommended changing instead of using the ash ray, uh, uh, 90, 92%, I think, which is uh, a little higher than the, the regular, they, they changed the design temperature differences between the indoor and the outdoor in the winter from 90 degrees or basically minus 20, which is typical there in Idaho Falls area, to a 70 degree indoor for a, uh, a 90 degree delta T, I think that's right, isn't it? To a uh, 72 degree delta T where they, they basically went from uh, uh, minus two to 70 degrees inside. Um, that, that was to help decrease the amount of energy that was gonna be used. The other, in the summertime, they looked at uh, an internal temperature of 74 degrees instead of 72. And then the, uh, the uh, aluminum, illuminance criteria to reduce the, some of the lighting levels uh, and watts that were input into the system. They, uh, the windows had been uh, reduced as much as, as they could do already, so that one wasn't really a, a factor in it. And then they, uh, they looked at reducing the loads on the building by using the high performance glazing, all the shading devices, uh, things that reduce glare, uh, the, the model actually ended up using a one watt per square foot number uh, for the lighting load interior. Um, they looked at the, the effect of the T8 lamps and the electronic dimming balance and, and those sort of things. And that model uh, gave us a, a good tool that we could use that showed, showed what was happening with the total integration of the design for the building, not just, well, let's let's go with a typical load and see what we, what we end up with. Uh, that model, uh, they used eQuest. The chart on the left indicates the uh, baseline building as it would be without all the uh, energy package or energy management uh, options that they wanted to run. The blue being the gas usage and the gray being the electrical usage. The model on the right is the building as with everything integrated that we were going to actually use in the design. So you can see there was quite a difference. Uh, their, their potential savings came up around 42,000. I think Idaho Power was estimating somewhere around 35 or $36,000 worth of savings. So that was a good tool to show the owner what all of these things that they were possibly paying a little bit extra for would show, but also it, it, it gave us the ability to reduce tonnage, reduce air handling sizes, duct sizes, and things like that. So there were some trade-offs where they might have spent a little more for the shading devices and the, and the bells and whistles on the electrical, but they spent a little bit less in uh, installed cost mechanically as well as operational. And, and that savings annual, annual, annual savings. Right. Yes, that's an annual savings, uh, the, the number that they've listed there. This is the. Excuse me, when yeah. you, you calculate a complete life cycle of cost savings or something like that instead of overall career. Now the question or was. Steve said, is it just an annual? Uh, the question was whether or not that was a life cycle cost versus an annual, and it was. It's not a life cycle cost. It was just an annual cost savings that they had estimated uh, per year for the the building. This is a uh, a, a pie chart that the eQuest produces. On the left is the base run again, and they're predicting in the yellow that the lighting costs were 29,000, and in the red we had the, the gas, the two major users of energy uh, being 24,000, and on the right uh, you can see we, we basically cut over half out of the electrical by reducing the wattage down to one, and as Jeff said, it's actually more than that, and on the, the right with the gas, we pretty much cut it in half uh, by using that sort of uh, model. The uh, 
So did, and I have to give York credit for all of these graphics. I, York International uh, is the, the manufacturer of the underfloor system that we used in this building, and I robbed some of their, uh, their sketches to show that the typical traditional overhead system with the ceiling diffuser and the return up high uh, in the summertime, it's trying to throw cold air, which does, does dump, but uh, it gets drafty. You gotta, you gotta use high velocities and things to get the air mixed. Uh, typically the, the men are too hot and the women are too cold. But another interesting thing about this uh, in terms of uh, the building being a healthy, vent well ventilated building, this system is trying to use, throw the fresh air down from the ceiling. The occupants are down below and, and basically as the, the gentleman on the left is, is uh, he's sweating and, and I, I like to liken we're all pretty much look like pig pen when we're sitting, standing, doing whatever we want. Uh, if, if someone used a microscope on us and actually looked at what we were doing, uh, there's clouds of uh, dead skin, little parts, all kinds of stuff that's floating around and depending upon how hot or agitated we are, it, it raises up. So these systems that, that supply from the ceiling are blowing that stuff down all around everybody. Uh, if he's coughing and got a cold and, and is coughing into the air streams, it's spread around. And so that's, that's one reason why a lot of the old traditional systems aren't as, uh, as uh, well ventilated or healthy, I guess, in the environment uh, for people. And that was one of the things that they wanted with their people. We want, how can we reduce that uh, sick building, sick uh, people not coming to work? So. The underfloor system then uses what they call a displacement concept. What you're doing is introducing the air into the floor plenum up through the floor. That air is, has been filtered, it's got its fresh air into it, it hasn't been touched by anybody and it also doesn't see all the pollutants that we put into the air. That air raises up and as it raises from cool to warm, it convex basically up towards the ceiling. All the polluted air gets picked up. The, the things that are airborne, the heat, a lot of the heat from the lights, the equipment and the things as it raises up goes through the returns and back to the equipment. So from that, using that, that uh, scenario, you have a, a, a cleaner, more healthy, comfortable zone where the people live, the heat and all the stuff up above is pulled out and taken away. I apologize for no pictures, uh, they, they were real jazzed about that floor system with all the pedestals. They're glued down every 24 inches on center. They didn't want people dragging through, knocking stuff off, pulling it over. So they, uh, they put the pedestals down, threw the mechanical in and put the floor on before anybody got much in the way of pictures of what was going on. So I, I've got the, the drawings. This one happens to be the first floor HVAC plan. It's pretty busy. We didn't use the underfloor system on the first floor. They, the, uh, the first floor is their large training area. They, they use it for some public things, things like that. So they, they wanted a separate system that they could run nights, weekends, things like that. Uh, so we, we took it off of there. Plus it, it consisted a, a lot of the large training rooms with, with uh, huge people loading and things. If we did the underfloor system, the amount of air and the diffusers that were gonna be required in that floor were such that moving chairs and tables and, and things like that, plus the, the difference in occupancy loading, it, it just didn't make all that much sense. So this is a traditional VAV overhead cooling system using fan-powered terminal boxes that, uh, that give us the ability to heat the air uh, without doing any reheating, they get their fresh air and their cooling air from, the, from a rooftop unit that, that uses uh, medium pressure ductwork uh, down into the space. So nothing spectacular about that. Uh, it, it does, we did zone it from a perimeter interior standpoint so that uh, we weren't trying to do all of the cooling from one diffuser in the center of the room to, to help uh, make it, the space more comfortable. This is the uh, typical underfloor plan. You, you can see there in the center, oh, there it is. Right in here is our central supply shaft. We're coming down off the roof with the, uh, the air and it's using a low pressure air design 
to come out on each floor through the fire smoke dampers and then it's ducted within the floor plan out or within the floor pedestals out to the the basic zone area we have two types of boxes the ones in the middle that are kind of spidered together with just a square box they're cooling only boxes and then on the perimeter we have what they call their combination uh, heating cooling box and I'll show you how that works in a second but basically that floor plenum is pressurized from the roof using uh, using uh, refrigerated air and economizers comes down onto the floor and each one of the ducts that are going out into the different areas has a pressure damper on it so that the sensor within the floor can feel what what's going on air-wise based upon how many of the boxes are calling for cooling or how many are closed and then it, it, it sends a signal to the air conditioning unit on the roof to, uh, to uh, set temperature as well as it also controls that pressure damper under the floor creating a back pressure which then the, the unit on the roof backs off with its variable volume uh, speed controls. But you can see the perimeter all has a, the combination heating cooling zone. Since there weren't a lot of uh, offices on the, the second and third floor, we were able to use larger zones to reduce the cost in there. On the uh, east end, there are some offices. Then you can see we've got the smaller corner zones that pick up those offices. All of the ductwork for those zones is under the floor. The heating piping for the heating coils is under the floor. All of the uh, control wiring is all underneath that floor, so it's, uh, it's accessible without getting up into the ceiling. And uh, it's pretty much a plug and play type system. This is the roof plan. Uh, we put the boiler plant up, up on the roof there. We have two gas fired boilers with a couple of pumps. Uh, it's a variable volume pumping system with two way valves on our, our heating coils so we can uh, only use what water we need. The, that water temperature to reset based on uh, outside air temperature so that we're not providing too hot of water to do the job. You can see in the center there the two low pressure VAV rooftop units that are supplying the floor and those big ducts run out through the mansard roof and go down and the uh, the design of that those those air handlers were sized using that model as a uh, uh, not how we size them but to how, how we can figure out the reduced amount of air and tonnage that we needed and then we also put in pressure dampers in the system so that in the morning on the east side as the sun comes up and rolls around the building the east and the south side is where the majority of the cooling load is that we with those pressure dampers we can actually shift that that air from the west or the east to the west side as the load changes throughout the day so that's why we have the large ducts that are the same size on both sides being fed off the same units we're able to actually use a smaller unit with less amount of air so we can use that air in the west in the afternoon in the east in the morning as the load changes around the building the the unit that's running east and west is the first floor VAV unit that provides the cooling for the, the uh, first floor. And then there's another little unit, that RTU-4, uh, having a nice, open, airy, fun stairwell on the south with lots of glass required a little air conditioning unit. So we put that unit on to take care of that. This is a, uh, the York system that utilize, that's utilized on the perimeter. It, it's got the, uh, the same, um, not the same type of box, but it's the same principle where the box is open to the floor on one side and it has a duct on the other. In the cooling mode, the air is going into the box from the floor and out. And when it shifts to heating mode, there's a damper in that box that shifts over, closes off the opening into the floor plenum. And then that item that's got a one with a circle on it is the heating fan with a heating coil that comes on and it takes interior boxes, the ones with the threes, and pulls air from the space so we're not heating cold air that's under the floor through the heating coil and, and just distributes it on the perimeter. So the heating fans only operate when it's in the heat mode. This is a section through that. That's what you would see under the floor if I had a picture is the fan terminal unit in the center with the heating coil 
and then the uh, the MIT G it's called is is pulling the return air out of the space. The damper is closed off to the uh, to the floor plenum, which has the cool air in it. So it's in essence recirculating air within the space and not doing any reheating or wasting energy because we've got a lot of cold air we're trying to trying to utilize. A lot of the early systems that they put in, they used traditional VAV fan boxes, put them underneath the floors, but they didn't have any way of shutting off that floor air and they ended up reheating a lot of plenum air that was cold because you, you still have interior spaces that need your cooling air. So that heater takes that return air through the heat and then it dumps it out uh, on the uh, perimeter to take care of the, the load. Now when it's in the cooling mode, the fan is off and you see that damper is moved from the one side of the box and it's now closing off the, the duct connections and it's allowing the air from the floor plenum, which is the cooling air, out and up into the space. So it's a pretty ingenious little device. This is a picture of the boxes. I probably should have shown that first. The, the uh, one on the right is a cooling only box. You can kind of, there's a little worm gear uh, damper rod there that, that the uh, damper blade runs on and it literally runs from one side to the other based upon how much air you need. In full cooling that damper is clear on the uh, upper side and the box is open and, and it, it'll let out about 150 CFM right out of the floor. And then the, as the thermostat modulates down because it's overcooling, that damper moves towards the, the open hole and it reduces the amount of air that it lets out of the floor. The design of their diffuser grills is such that as that damper moves, you can see at 50% only half the grill is exposed. So it keeps a, a constant velocity so you don't end up with, you've all been in buildings where you, you walk in and it's nice and quiet and then all of a sudden you hear this rushing noise coming out and it starts getting drafty. Well that's because the velocity is going up and down in that diffuser. Whereas this diffuser design here is such that it, as that damper closes, it closes off the area too and it keeps the velocity the same, reducing drafts. The box on the left is the heating box. You can see the inlet collar where the, when it's in the heating mode that damper's all the way over to the uh, right side, closing off the plenum, and the uh, heat air comes in the round duct. Same design in terms of velocity profiles and, and all that. <coughs> They've changed that design. We ended up with these. They had, had some, uh, some construction issues where the, the worm drive was on, uh, that gets supported on the uh, end panel were a little too high and as a damper came across they would jam on about 50 percent open and the worm worm drive motor is very powerful it would keep grinding away and eventually it was popping the the uh, motor mount brackets off so they they came in and did a little modification in the field and took care of that but uh, that was kind of an interesting problem it made me wonder if we were the only one that had this but they claim they've got two million square feet of this in the United States, so it, it's working, working well. Um, before we get into the incentives, some of the lessons learned on this, uh, York, York's a good system. When we went with the York system because it's simple, uh, a lot of the, the systems uh, that are, were being stall, installed are using the more complicated, they're trying to adapt the above ceiling type systems to the underfloor and and they're, they're really complicated. This system uh, being York, uh, a parent, its parent company being Johnson Controls, we did have the Johnson Control DDC system specified on this and the front end computer then ran the rooftop units, the boiler plant, did all the resetting and then the York system came with it, its own controls and they have an integrator that ties back to the DDC system. They've since come out with integrators that talk to other people uh, rather than Johnson, but the nice thing was that they plugged in their integrator, it went out and it mapped every one of those boxes, came back and gave it an IP address to the system and, and it knew where it was, how it was, and how it was to be set up. So it, it, was, it was really nice from that standpoint. Uh, the control contractor uh, got a little behind and kind of a testimonial to how well this system worked he showed up in a bind, turned everything on, and 
then left and the system ran for, you know, we, we got the old, yeah, it's all up and running and everything's fine routine. Uh, the system ran with uh, switches reversed, all kinds of stuff for two and a half months and there were no complaints in the building because it works that well, this, the, this, this displacement ventilation. If that had been a traditional overhead system, we'd have been sunk. And uh, we, we did specify a mechanical commissioning, which I'm glad we did. At first I thought it might have been a little excessive, but I put in 40 hours of on-site training with the owner, but I said it had to be done in four separate sessions, or five separate sessions, a minimum of six, maximum of six hours each. And that doesn't add up to 40, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, what that enabled us to do when they first showed up, they thought, well, well, we'll go in and we'll spend a half hour here and an hour there and, and be gone by noon. And I pointed this out and they kind of, oh, gee. But what that enabled us to do was to get the owner more involved. The owner had moved in. They were living with the thing. They knew of some problem areas and they had been playing with the computer. And uh, that way they, they were able to, to get involved with this guy. And then they found out, well, he really hadn't done his job yet. And uh, so they, they sat there and watched him fix things, change things. And I think they know the system better than he does now. So hindsight being 2020 on that one, it was, uh, it was an awesome way to have gotten the building set up. Mike, do they have their own building in operation? Yeah, the question is whether they have their own building operators. And yeah, there, there are two people that are kind of in charge of all of their facilities and they're, they're housed in this building. So they've, they've got computers, uh, it's a web-based system. I anybody can call it up and look and see what their thermostat is set at and what it's doing. And uh, these two guys, like I say, being, being there for 40 hours with this guy while he did all his troubleshooting and, and programming on this was, was really good for them. They're very, very knowledgeable. Uh, this, this slide's showing our, uh, the, how the power incentives were um, used by Idaho Power. The top one being lightings. He had four, uh, four items that totaled up to his $9,000 with his light load reductions, the daylighting and occupancy sensors. Um, the air conditioning system we used Efficient AC units, we could have used less efficient units that uh, just met code, but we, we paid extra money for uh, higher EERs and COPs. The uh, additional uh, AC unit bonus was, well, I don't remember what that was for. I guess it was exciting. Uh, that was we exceeded their amount by a certain percentage. Oh, percentage right. Okay, they gave us a little bump because we, we went beyond the the minimum. Uh, the, the larger units were over five tons, so they had to have economizers on them anyway, but uh, one small unit for the stairwells, we put an economizer on that and they gave us a little nudge there. Uh, Steve's roof was reflective and they gave him some for that, plus they actually kicked in for going with the better windows over, uh, over the minimum code. Uh, when the one, the part where they're really excited is the uh, energy management controls by putting in the DDC system uh, and allowing them the controls and, and the ability to make changes and monitor, uh, they kicked in a pretty good chunk there. The demand controlled ventilation, the underfloor system, they really like that. They, they gave in uh, a uh, dollar per square foot amount just on the ventilation air that was, was circulated. And then the fact that we use variable speed drives on all of our equipment, pumps and air handlers uh, gave them that. So the grand total was 105, 525. We blew their max. They would only give us 100. <laughs> <laughs> but the owner was happy about that. Uh, Steve, you want to take over? Sorry, web guys. <laughs> Just to wrap up here, we're almost out of time here, but everybody's interested in construction costs, it seems like, after the, after the fact here. So we just did some basic arithmetic on the building. And this doesn't include the site work costs. This is just building, building construction. Uh, building construction costs, this includes the mechanical and electrical in, in that particular number. It's 178 bucks a square foot. Uh, mechanical costs, this number, particular number includes plumbing and fire sprinklers. 
came in about 27. If you take those numbers out, the actual mechanical system that Mike was spent some time talking about came down to about $22 a square foot. And then Jeff's electrical uh, number there, that was 26. And that 26, that includes not all, only the lighting, but also all, all the power and the fire alarm system and, and telecom systems there. Ken? Since you have a traditional system, maybe it's on, on the bottom floor and the UFAD on the other floors, can you compare their square footage cost between them, the, uh, those floors? Um, the question was is if, if we can compare the cost between the, the typical um, system down on the lower, lower floor versus the underfloor air, air distribution system uh, on the upper floors. And we didn't, do, uh, we didn't do a breakout on construction costs on that, but we certainly can to, to get that. I don't know if you want to add anything else on that, well, Mike. Well, traditionally, what we're seeing here anyway, <coughs> traditionally what we're seeing here in terms of construction costs is they're, they're similar between an overhead VAV versus the underfloor. <coughs> and, and I don't know if that's going to change as more and more people come up with the underfloor systems or not, but uh, the, uh, the costs are pretty comparable. So there'll be cost premium to do the UFAD, the underfloor? Not mechanically, no. Okay. Is there much of an additional cost just to build the underfloor system architecturally? The question was whether or not there was additional cost to do the architectural floor. Um, yeah, there's definitely additional cost to build that particular floor in in, in the, on each floor plate versus the traditional, you wouldn't have that cost of the access floor system. So there is a little bit of cost there for it. Because back when they used to do underfloor computer systems, you know, that underfloor system was quite expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, th this system uh, is lighter duty, if you will, because it doesn't have to support the weight of the equipment that a computer room had in it. So. Uh, from that standpoint, it's not near as expensive, but it is a uh, a uh, concrete panel, and they're they're heavy and they're solid. Uh, one of the things that that I think the general contractor on this was surprised about was the ceiling that had to go on underneath that floor. They Steve had called for all the perimeter walls to be caulked, and they gave us the old well, gee, that's like fifty thousand feet of caulk, and it says, yeah, we know, but it has to be done, <laughs> and. Uh, so they, they actually had the mechanical contractor cordon off a little area under the floor and they, they pressurized it with a fan and put smoke in there before because they were, they were sure they didn't have to seal that and smoke was coming out the window edges around the, the glass, the, up through the mullions, mm -hmm. uh, all over the place and they said, okay, we give and they actually, I think they went and hired a high school kid and gave him 10,000 cases of caulk and he went around there and uh, caulked it up. And, being all under the floor, it didn't have to look all that good. It just had to do a job of sealing all the, all the cracks. It would have been a terrible deal to not have that done and turn on the system and not have anything that we were expecting. So that would have been a bad deal. Are there any other questions? We're, we're almost uh, out of town. One more Time. on that cost per square foot. How would that compare with um, uh, an architecture? Yeah, with expectations. How did it compare with our expectations? Okay, yeah. The um, the question was, how did the final construction cost compare with the with the owner's expectations? Um, the owner's he, uh, the owner's a good client. Um, originally, we started out, I think, with about oh, just talking. Probably they wanted to spend close to around twelve million twelve million dollars when when we were doing uh, just programming, you know, they just kind of had this number out there that they wanted to spend no more than $12 million. As, as we went ahead and toured different facilities and started talking about concepts and, and building design, they felt that it would, uh, you know, we could go ahead and keep within the $12 million budget, but not, not necessarily get all the bells and whistles that they really wanted to achieve in their building. Uh, that the other um, financial institutions are doing that in the buildings we visited in Salt Lake. So they're trying to, to compete with, with, the, with the other other financial institutions. So as we went on through the design process, working with the uh, construction manager, they were giving us some updated uh, budgets as we moved along down the design process. And of course, the number kept on you know creeping up, creeping up. And... Um, 
And but the owner owner was okay with that. There was there we did very little value engineering on on the building. The probably the biggest value engineering item, which I was extremely pleased about, was uh, the building pretty much originally looked like it does today. Uh, during the schematic design, as I showed you on those original elevations. But as we were working through the design process and visiting some of those other buildings in Salt Lake, they noted that some of the executive offices actually had balconies out on them, out on the, out on the, out, outside the offices where they had private doors to go outside and get fresh air. So we went through this whole gyration of actually building exterior balconies all around the fourth floor of that building. And I said, oh my God. And, um, so that was all priced out, and that was a big chunk of change to do that. So, uh, so then we started talking about waterproofing, damp proofing, leak, you know, all the good, all the good stuff that owners like to hear about as as they live throughout the building, uh, the life of the building. So that was probably the biggest VE item yanked off the building. Everything else uh, pretty much stayed in stayed intact. So as far as the owner's expectations, um, they were happy with starting out about twelve and ending up for just over thirteen. So it was, it was a good, successful project, and, uh, and they seem to be very pleased with them, given the amount of time they've been into it to date. So. And I want to clarify real quick. When you put the graph of the, or the chart of the paid and three costs, the mechanical and electrical costs were already included in the 178, right? So the end number of the non-site work and construction costs was 178. Correct. That's 178 without site work cost. Um, if there are any, any other questions, we sure appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, present this project uh, to everybody that's here as well as everybody that's, that's been uh, listening and watching on the web. So thanks, Kevin. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you all. This is a great uh, And I just wanted to say, you know, the, the process of working with these guys was great. And uh, we did a little bit. You guys did a lot. And... Uh, I think really interesting success stories and also really valuable lessons learned, um, not only on the design side but on the construction side and as we live with the building, you know, and not live with it but live in the building, we'll, you know, working with the owners, I'm sure we'll learn a few more things. So really valuable thing for Idaho's sort of design community. So thank you for doing such a great job. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think that will wrap it, folks. So uh, I'm, again, on behalf of the University of Idaho, thanks for coming. And uh, enjoy the energy conference if you're going that way. And if you're not, you should. And uh, enjoy Halloween and Green Build if you're heading there. Register for the energy and Green Build conference at idahocities.org. And uh, see you all again on November 14th. So thanks again.